All right, Mitchie Slick, man. We got uh, San Diego's own up in here. How you doing? I'm good, homie. I'm alive, homie. You know, shit. Yeah, that. That's what's up, man. Uh, well, let's start off from the beginning. You know, I like to uh, try to get to know people better. I like to make it better, you know, for the fans to get to know you a little bit better for the people who don't know you. Um, we, we know everybody knows you're from San Diego. Um, tell tell me a little bit about what life was like for you growing up there. Um, I grew up in an influential time, homie, where you know, or you know, the crack era. I actually, actually, for the youngsters, they probably don't really understand what that means growing up in that time. And we don't really look at it being in my generation as 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 impactful as it was because it was everyday life for us. But man, the world went crazy. When the world went crazy, and 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 the poorest and the poorest niggas on the block turned into the richest, and the richest turned into the poorest. When that type of shit was going on, is when I grew up. I grew up in the crack era, homie. When you know a lot of, a lot of a lot of the main events that kind of like dictated how the the street code is today, you know, took place. Them 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 late '80s and mid '80s was crazy. You know what I mean? So. Southeast San Diego, we play football uh, heavy, you know what I'm saying, in the street. We, we threw rock shot, BB guns, did all the shit every, every other kid does. But just it was at that time when, when the shit was like really, you know, forming into some other shit. Gang bang was at its highest peak of whatever it ever was. And, and drug dealing was at its highest peak of whatever it's ever been in the history of America. And I was a child of that. And how old were you? Do you remember when yeah, you Yeah, I was like all nine, this? ten years old. You know, at them years when you learned everything. And that's when, you know, 86, 87 was hitting around. I'm a little kid seeing, you know, the homies really having money. It was, you know, gang banging millionaires. That's when niggas was gang banging but was rich. Not rich and get out the hood and get clean, but when the people that had the money actually was still on the block. So I really, you know, saw that time. You know, when 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 you know niggas was Killing for money, not for just stupid shit like now. Not like killing is good, period. But it was about money during that time. And that's the difference between, you know, then and now. All right. So you're growing up, I mean, eight, nine years old, man. That's that's really young to be exposed to all that, man. What are some of the defining moments that you remember, like, back then that, like, maybe shaped you as you were growing? Um, you know, my, my mom and pops was young. Having, having, you know, having, like, you know, had had their shit together. So I grew up in the, um, the, the my beginning years, I was living in an area called uh, the Valencia Views. This ain't O'Farrell Park now. It's a, it's a blood neighborhood in San Diego. And um, my parents was younger than all the rest of the parents over there because, you know, they were so young buying these brand new houses. So all the kids over there was really older than me. You know what I mean? So I'd be outside playing with, you know, 10, 11 year olds when I'm five and six years old. And then um, I was a little advanced, you know what I mean? And so then when my parents split up, I moved, you know, not too far away. It, 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 it's not too far away where the climate changes because I moved, you know, a little bit further towards like um, more like the center of Southeast San Diego off of Logan and by Lincoln and all that shit. And, um, you know, my mom used to have me fresh when I was a kid, fresh, you know what I'm saying? Nordstrom's, Neiman Marcus and shit like that. And um, me being a little bit more advanced, you know, it wasn't hard to tell that I was, I was a sharp little dude and I was a tough little dude socking up on, you know, and, and even though I was doing all that shit, I was real clean. I have on the Argyle socks and shit with the, with the you know, the, plaid sweater and shit and um I remember one day one of my older homies told me um my, my big homie Kenny Demon I think he might have been in the sixth grade and I was in the second grade or the third grade probably the third grade and he, he kneeled me down on the playground one day and he told me he was like maybe the fourth grade he was like little homie check it out you hard you tough and all you know what I'm saying but Homie, you got to tell your mama to quit dressing you like that. Get your uniform right, basically is what he was saying. I had on all these square clothes and shit, penny loafers and shit, 
Argyle socks and shit. And he was telling me, homie, you know, that was that was one of the first moments when I basically was told by another kid that I have to dress different. So I, I'm just thinking as I got older, from my mom's perspective, like you teach your kid to do right, feeding him right, grooming him right, lacing him right on his, you know, teaching him, educating him. You send him to school in the morning thinking you're doing the right thing. And then when your nine or 10 year old son get to school, it's an older kid, you know what I'm saying, 12, 13 year old kid telling your son not to dress like this and to dress like that. And, and that's crazy because I remember I had signed up, not signed up, but you, you get to be the, um, to be the class president or be on the student council, you know, the kids vote for you. And it's basically a popularity contest at that time. I didn't really care about being the, the, the president or vice president, but I was in the fifth grade and I won. And I didn't even want to do that. And so then I remember one day I'm walking after the homie done told me to dress different. And one of the uh, one of the um, counselors at the school said, um, you know what, um, little Charles, now that you're vice president, president, you might want to stop wearing your hair like that. And I had the French braids, you know, straight back braids with the hair net on, the golfer hat. I had the Pendleton, Levi's, Chuck Taylors folded, LP, 50s on the tongue. This is in the fifth grade, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And this is before, like, it was real gang intervention. So the teachers didn't know what the fuck was going on. So we gang banging at school, you know what I'm saying? Like a motherfucker, you know what I'm saying? Flagging and everything. But this is when it's still kind of like new, you know what I'm saying? Not new, new, but I'm saying like... It wasn't until 15 years in till it started being real gang intervention and shit like that, you know what I mean? So it was crazy. This teacher told me to change my hair and don't dress like that no more. And then I remember the next year I won president without even really wanting to be the, I won president and I was so tied into the homies that I didn't, I just didn't do it. Just cause that wasn't, that wasn't being from the gang, doing all that good shit like that. And I just think back how fucked up that was to be in an environment like that, I was an only child, you know what I'm saying? I, I couldn't go against the grain. I couldn't tell my mama or no shit like that. So I rolled the line of listening to my mama and listening to the homies and staying true and, 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 and staying on, you know, on, on the narrow to where I didn't fuck up nothing at school, but I didn't fuck up nothing with the homies. And that's kind of how I got my whole demeanor and how I became slick, you know what I'm saying? How I got the name slick. So you were kind of like conflicted of you know, kind of at that point, which way you were going to go, but you were it wasn't already no choice. It wasn't no choice. You, you already going this way, but it's just like my mom and them wasn't with that shit. You know what I'm saying? I couldn't look or act or do none of that shit like a gangbanger coming in my house as a young cat. You know what I'm saying? That, it wasn't, it wasn't. But at the same time, my, my gang shit wasn't about being bad or fucking up. It was just about, you know, surviving basically. Cause growing up as an only child in my neighborhood, that that's, 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 that's tricky. You know what I'm saying? I don't got no brothers or no older relatives to go get or nothing like that. So I had to figure out a way to, to um, make it and survive. And that's what that's what folks don't understand, homie. Like, like, like I got a song called No Choice, and that's what I be basically saying to the police. Like, if you was in our in our situation, you would do the same thing we was doing. It's about survival. You know what I mean? Shit happened at school. You can't go tell your mama. You can't even come to school tomorrow with that. You know what I'm saying? So you got to figure out a way to get in where you fit in. And for me, that's where being from the neighborhood came in at. Not necessarily want to be bad and fuck up shit, because I never got in no trouble in school or no shit like that. It was just to be a part of the gang. So when shit got violent and got active, I had somebody that was with me. And it was getting active early. So you're growing up in this environment, and it's all around you. At what point did you actually become... A member, a gang member. How early was it? See, it's it's, it's like so, so it's different ways to get in. Some people is in by choice. Some people is in just by affiliation. Some people is born in. My situation wasn't a situation where I turned because of my parents wasn't teaching me right or I was fucked up. It it it, it just came from me being popular in my neighborhood. It started off with pop Warner football. You know what I'm saying? That camaraderie is serious. Like I said before, we, we play football in my city. So everything in San Diego is based around football first. So just that neighborhood got their football team. This neighborhood got our football team. Coincidentally, that neighborhood's Pop Warner football team is the color of their gang. And our Pop Warner football team is the color of my high school and my gang. My, my, my neighborhood is green. 
My mama been in the stand saying, go big green since I was eight years old. So having pride for this color didn't come from being from the gang. You feel what I'm saying? So these cats on the other side, the other team, them not liking me, shit. At nine, y'all don't like each other on the football field. But at 15, you know, you don't have to say I'm gangbanging and I want to be, be, be a, 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 a gang member to be involved in some type of gang activity. All you got to do is have his girlfriend like you. And now you over here talking about I'm trying to go to school and play football. And this is a motherfucker that done quit playing football. He want to gangbang now. Y'all getting into it over the girl, not over the gang. We see each other at the skating rink. I whoop his ass. His homies ain't going to watch that. They jump on me. The homies that I grew up next door to and play football with, I can't say whether they gang members or not. I'm not going to stop hanging with him because from age 12 to 13, he decided to be from football player to gang member. He's my homie. We at the skating rink. I get in. His homies jump on me. They homies jump on me. No matter what I say at that point, I'm from the gang. <laughs> you feel me? I'm yeah. from the neighborhood. Straight up. That's how I go. Shit. Shit. So, I was in day one. Shit. Without even involuntarily. You feel me? Yeah. Yeah, man. Uh, sad situations. You know, growing up in, in that environment. You're still going to school. Yep. And at what point did, you know, the violence kick in? Hmm. We, Because you mentioned, you mentioned the crack era. So I take it that it was it was always there, I, I assume. But at, at one point, it must have been Chris, worse Chris for you. Chris was coming up to my school to fight me when I was 11 and 12 years old from the other hood. Chris was coming up to my school at 11 and 12 years old, and it wasn't over gangs. It was over girls. It was over who's tough. Nigga on the phone talking to a little 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 girl and oh yeah, what's the name of them said this and what and then it's on the you know and now you're on the phone talking shit. And the next time y'all see each other, it's on. That was going on at 11, 12 years old. But yeah, we, we was acting like we was gangbanging at 11 and 12 years old. But really, it was over girls. But the same niggas that you're fighting at 7 years old on the football field and the same niggas that you're fighting at 12 years old over girls that you see at the skating rink and you fight with them is, a, is grow up to be the same niggas as, you know, he don't care that you, it's five years later and you socked him up five years ago. He's 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 ready now. He out here shooting niggas and shit now. And when he see you, you know, you could you could just be an athlete now. But if he got problems with you, you're going to have to figure out what to do in this situation. So either this nigga's on the other side of the field, on the other side of the, of the city and he's shooting niggas. He don't like me because his girl from way back. What I'm going to do? Go tell my mama? Tell the police? That put, put you in a situation. I don't care who you are. I don't give a fuck what you doing in your life now. If you was in that situation, you're going to do one or two things. You're going to either move, you're going to tell the police, or you're going to shoot back. That's the, that's the situation for any kid growing up in Southern California, any black neighborhood in Southern California. Either he's going to not be it and get the fuck away from it, or he's going to tell, or he's going to, you know what I'm saying, give back. At what point did your family realize that you were involved in gangs? Um, I got into a big fight at this football game one time. And you got to remember the whole time, homie, I'm getting grades. I'm going to school. I'm not missing no school, no referrals or nothing. But like I said, in Southern California, you don't, you don't get to choose this shit. You know what I'm saying? The parents know what's happening. You know what I'm saying? The parents know what's going on. They, they, they know what colors not to wear outside and what time to come in and what's going on. I think when I when I first I I, I I got into a big fight one time and everybody at this Pop Warner game heard my name on the loudspeaker and like I said the whole time I wasn't fighting or getting into it with niggas about gang shit. That's what they always say. It's over colors. It's not over colors. It's it's not over. It's never hardly over colors. It's never been over colors. It's always been over personal issues and shit like that. And now they homies is in and they homies is in. Yeah, it was, I was fucking probably 15 years old. Mom's moved me to Texas. I got into a big fight. She shot me to Texas. I ended up going to high school in Texas for a year. Mm, so uh -huh. as soon as your mom figured out that you was 
You, all the way in for all sure. All the way in for sure. She, she wasn't with it. She wasn't with it. Shot me to Texas. I went from being in the street, hanging with the homies at Lincoln Park, and going to Lincoln High and, and doing my thug thing and all that shit, playing quarterback in high school. I played quarterback in Lincoln High at this time. I went from doing that and thugging, basically, to going to church three times a week, homie, for fun. That's how, <laughs> that's how strict my life was when I went to Lubbock, Texas, homie. I was going to church for fun, just to see some females or something at church. You know, and and that, it was a shock, a culture shock. But I actually went out there to Texas and really, like, was around. I was around when, when um, shit, gangbanging first basically hit West Texas. So basically, um, my mom sent me to Texas to get away from the gangbanging shit. She sent me out there with my cousin Daphne, which is my mom's cousin. They like sisters. Rest in peace. Um, she picked me up from the airport. She telling me about, you know, how we ain't going to be doing the shit I was doing at home and all that and whatever, whatever, whatever gang shit behind you or whatever. As I'm pulling up into the neighborhood where she live, it's about 30 crips up at the park having initiations in the neighborhood where I'm moving to. So you're, you're a, a blood kid. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and you move right into the middle of a crip neighborhood. A new crip neighborhood is just getting popping. It was L.A. It was thirties, the L.A. thirties, and there was some L.A. niggas in 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 Lubbock, Texas, getting it cracking back in the eighties, late eighties. How'd that work out for you being there? It was a trip because I, I went I lived over there by Dunbar High School in Lubbock, Texas. I know they're gonna trip when they hear that because I ain't, I ain't I ain't really been back back there in a while. Well, I went back and visited a little while ago. But then I went to a school in the Blood neighborhood. Over there and um, I went to Estacado High School in Lubbock. And so basically, with it being so new there, all the kids was just tripping off me and my staff, basically trying to learn how to do this gangbanging shit off me. So I was living around the Chris, but they would hang with me just to see how I got down. You know what I mean? And then I made friends with some Bloods on, 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 that went, by my, went, went to school where I was at. But I was out there trying to get my grades together, and I actually found out going to school out there by how strict school and education is in Texas that I really was fucking smart and shit. And so then I stayed out there for a year and a half or two. And then after that, I came back to San Diego. And um, school was easy as fuck. I had one more year of school to go, and I was on an honor roll after that as a senior. Okay, so, so you, <laughs> so you moved you move to Texas. Right. So it sounds like you, you kind of got on a better path. Nah, I just started doing my work. It wasn't nothing for me to do. I'm, it wasn't shit to do out there. So it was nothing I could do. Okay. I wasn't good. I just was, couldn't do shit. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> so I went to school. And, then, and you come got back. Got my grades up. And, and what happens? When, and you still sound like you're still doing good in class and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I never fucked you up know? in school. My mom and them didn't play that shit. My mom and them is college educated people from grandmas to grandpas aunties uncles everybody but they they wasn't having that so i went out there and got my got my smarts together got my um learn how to actually be a student because california don't teach you how to be a student the way texas do they really in the education out there it's crazy so you you move back and what happens now are you still in the streets all the time, or do you go right back? Soon as I to the get back, thing? it get. Soon as I get back, it just turned all the way right back up, cause what I left for it was still lingering around, and and you know, I came right back and got to it, but I still was you know I was trying to be an athlete at the time. Still, I went to Chula Vista High School after that. Is there any situations uh, in the streets that, you know, like any serious situations you could talk about? Um, probably you went through. I, I probably ain't gonna talk about too much shit, but whatever I talk about, ain't yeah. No, nah, it was full active, gang banging and fighting. As as a young as a young cat, that's what we was doing in San Diego, and this when niggas was was still meet up and fight. Mm -hmm. It was a little different, you know what I'm saying? You had to, you had it. It was a little different then. Now all these youngsters just go straight to the guns off the off the gate. They rap about not fighting and shit. We came up fighting, actually knowing who was who and what was what. And every weekend, shit, 
That's all it was about. Even though I was trying to be a student and do good in school shit. That's all it was about. Okay, I, I seen in the old interview that Nick Nick Cannon's dad is an original member of Lincoln Park Bloods. So the way they asked that question in the interview, it was based upon that my answer was based upon it was it was during that time when um they was tripping off a uh, soldier boy and um Chris Brown and them and they was trying to say that you know they 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 let the they let the homies on in a in a you know out of line type of way and that they was letting the homies pay to get on and somebody brought that question to me at the time and I basically was stating well, that's not what's going on here with Nick. Nick family really grew up in our neighborhood. Nick grew up in the projects where we all from, you know, moved early, but his family is over there. His family been over there for years and his pops was around at the time when the homies first started getting the set cracking. Now, one of the forefront members sitting at the table when it got cracking, I'm not saying that, but he was one of the young homies that was running around the neighborhood at the time when, it, when, it, when, when, when the shit was getting put down, you feel me? Yeah, that, that, that's what it was. He wasn't no leader of the neighborhood or no shit like that. That's not what I said. What I said in that interview was that he was one of the first homies around at the time. And the big homies that's original members that was the first homies told me this. You feel me? So the interviewer, the, 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 the what you call it, the clickbait read a little bit different. You know what I'm saying? Than I was supposed to read. But Nick family been around in our neighborhood for, for, for a long time. And, and, and they grew up in the heart of our neighborhood. You know what I mean? I see. So that's how the connection with uh, you and Nick Cannon and everything for sure. happens is, is uh, his dad and everything? That to a degree, but nah, just, just us Nick, being... you knew Nick when he was a kid? Yeah. He oh, was okay. a little homie running around the neighborhood. He was a little kid. I was older than Nick, you know what I'm saying? But it come from being, being um, factors in our city just as much as that, you know what I mean? All right, I hear you. Are you familiar with the the Tiny Doe situation? Yep. All right, so for people that might not know, man, back in 2014, uh, Tiny Doe was arrested for murder with a $1 million bail. And he didn't even had the police didn't even accuse him of actually killing anybody. But they had him connected with night shootings without any evidence of it. And... The cops even told him at one point they knew he didn't do it, but they were going to arrest him anyway. And from what I understand, it was because he was documented, but he wasn't really a gang member. And um, I guess under some bullshit ass law, it's a felony to benefit from any gang activity. And he was selling CDs out of his car. And so because of that, they were able to charge him under this law. Can you talk about that a little bit? My city, my city, we done had a lot of blows that done kept us from being able to be successful successful in this music shit. And, um, San Diego don't be fucking with the urban shit, homie. You know what I mean? Not even like, it's so it's so evident, man. It's not it's like they not even doing it to be fucked up. It's like they don't even know how fucked up they doing us. This is so much a part of the fabric of our city to not fuck with the urban shit to where they don't even know they being fucked up by how they be shutting us down with everything. Anytime a new gang law come out in California, homie, San Diego try that shit out first. That ain't the first time they tried the shit. That ain't even the second time they tried the shit. They did it with the gang injunction. Gang injunction is a fucking law, a California gang ordinance that says even though you haven't been convicted of no crimes, even though you ain't been arrested or nothing like that, just off of hearsay, they could put you on this list that puts you basically like on this probation type shit. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Shit like, like I don't even, I, I, all they do is walk to some old lady's front door show her this book of this shit this thick and say, here go this crime record of all these bad kids in the neighborhood. Will you sign this to keep them from hanging it? Because I know you don't want them around here and you don't want them hanging and whatever, whatever. Sign this for us. Old lady signed this shit. It only take 24 signatures 
to get you on this list. This list is a list that says you can no longer hang in these areas with people from your neighborhood. Shit as little as can't have water guns or pit bulls or I can't flag nobody down on the side of the street or no shit like that. All these are violations that could get you sitting in jail. Now, each time you go, the time gets longer and longer, a week or two weeks or whatever. But it's a lot of homies that did a lot of time behind this gang injunction shit. And and that was a law that was made. And the only law, only gang that they put on it before us was the 18th Street Gang. That's the biggest gang in California. That's the biggest gang in the world. They went from 18th Street and then came to my house. You feel me? Like San Diego fucked up like that. So this was another law that they did in that case where, where what they basically said was because you are a documented gang member, um, you're using the celebrity of, your, of the neighborhood and the shit that the, that the gang members are doing to profit off of your music. Now, they won the case and it didn't work. But shit, man, they've been doing that shit to us for years, man. We just basically start having, um, you know, um, representation to fight back on that shit now. Homies was just getting railroaded for years, but now niggas really getting lawyers and shit and fighting back. So, yeah, man, that's my city. You'd mentioned there was a couple other cases similar to this one. Did they beat the case, too? No. So there's, there's people you know that are in jail for a long amount of time and didn't even commit a crime? Not didn't commit a crime, but got enhanced sentences and shit like that based upon them being in the organized crime, in organized crime gangs. When anybody in Southern California or any motherfucking where know, Crips and Bloods ain't organized, you feel me? But then you'll do a little bullshit crime and then they'll smack you over the head with the same time they smack John Gotti with or some shit like that. They found a way to make gang banging organized crime, even though it ain't organized crime. What did you think when you heard about Tiny Doe facing life in prison over I, some lyrics? I already knew, and that's part of the reason why I say my city has had a lot of things that get in the way of us not being as successful because a lot of the shit that we do as 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 artists and gangster artists we couldn't you know we we want to do them being a san diego artist but we can't get away with that shit you know it's shit that i see motherfuckers all over the country do atlanta chicago all that shit guns all in the video and that shit kids is fucking fascinated by that shit that's part of the reason why these records and shit be selling because they're able to put on the whole act of the gangster shit where, where, where I'm from in Southern California, you do that shit and your ass to be in jail. You know what I'm saying? And they'll be trying to stick you with the same shit they were trying to stick him with. You know what I mean? But Did you get put on a gang injunction at any time? Yeah. I was the first person on gang injunction. From your hood? Yeah. From San Diego. From San Diego? Yeah. Why'd they come after you first? Cause you, just because you're Mitchie Slick? No, I wasn't no rapper when they put me on the list. Oh, okay. That was before the rap shit. Way so, before the rap shit. So this was just your your street yeah, reputation? Shit. Yeah. Okay. So uh, Tiny Doe, man, he spent seven months in jail. And, and finally, after seven months, the judge disagreed with the use of the gang law and dismissed the charges against him. And he actually just recently uh, won a settlement for mm -hmm. $1.5 from him. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I guess... Uh, you know, that worked out in his favor, I guess. First time ever. You know, I in mean. 40 years of, of, of our neighborhood, that's the first time I ever heard of some shit working out in the favor of a homie. I mean, I mean, by the judgment of the, of the you know, like that. So as I was going through some of your music, um, I noticed you had a song called Dr. Cube. What was the concept behind that? I was speaking for all the artists that's unsung and they put in hella work and feel like they deserve a shot at a at a you know getting in getting on the getting on the um on the big stage and that's because at the time and for a long time if you wasn't from that dr dre tree or with cube or that nwa tree you wasn't gonna get no shine because you know that's basically the only outlet at the time. All the artists had basically came from Indu from Mac 10 to Game to whoever came later, Exhibit, after NWA and all that shit, Pac, all the West Coast shit was coming through Dr. Dre. So basically, I had no intentions of them. I wasn't even thinking about them really hearing the song, but I made a song from that artist 
perspective that feels like he's done everything it takes to get that look. So it, it was it was it was it, it, it was all in fun, you know what I mean? But at the same time, it had real, real, you know, cause shit. If you hear what I was saying in the song, I said a lot of shit that'll make you think my resume is on deck to be on that stage. You know what I'm saying? I fuck with damn near everybody that Dre and Cube fuck with. But a lot of artists might feel like that, and they was feeling like Drake fuck with me, fuck with me. So I just wrote a rap from a perspective of an artist that felt like that. That's it. So it was the doctor was for Dr. Dre and the cube, and the cube was for, for Ice cube. cube, right? Okay. Um, and so it was like just it was just basically like a concept, like you know what what else do I got to prove, right? Right. I didn't like, get all the shit, all the small magazines, and said my albums was classics. All the artists that you fuck with got me on their albums. Yo DJs is my DJs. The niggas that make your beats is my producers. I said all that shit, you know what I mean? And, uh, you know, it was, just, it was just from the perspective of every young artist that feel like he, he did his shit, you know what I mean? That's it. Right, right. Well, why did you choose Dr. Dre and Ice Cube? Because them is the motherfuckers that hold the keys to the West Coast, straight up. At that time, if you wasn't fucking with Dr. Dre or Ice Cube, you, you, you nothing. What year did the song come out? Shit, I don't know. Maybe like 06 or something. 06, okay. 07. That's when uh, I think Game, you know? Game was hot at the time. Everybody, you can look through everybody. The first motherfucker to actually get some shine nationally without being from the NWA tree, I damn near would say it was YG. YG did, yeah. Uh, you can think yeah. all you want. I'm telling Glasses. you, I do this. Glasses? Nah, he came from MAC-10. He was with MAC-10. Cash Money, MAC-10. He came out, but at the same time, his shine, his biggest shit came through MAC-10. And Glasses came out with Game, too. Game, game, Glasses was around Game a lot. So that shit is still off that tree, connected. That's true. That's yeah, true. Yeah, straight up. And why do you think you didn't get more opportunities? Just I'm because you're out of San Diego? Yeah, yeah, for sure. That must have been frustrating. There's a motherfucker. So did you come up here? You did a lot, a lot of networking up here, I take My it? My first real shit was in L.A. Yeah, I started coming to L.A. in, two, in like 99. Young cat, straight up here. Kid, trying to see what's happening. Start fucking with Exhibit and um, I first start fucking with Sir Jinx. Shout out to Sir Jinx, you know what I mean? That's who gave me the game. And then the Liquid Crew took me in by way of Exhibit and, and the relationship that uh, Sir Jinx had with Exhibit at the time. And from fucking with Liquid Crew came me fucking with uh, the Alcoholics and, you know, Tash, that's my brother. If you heard my first album, the first verse of my first album say, I, I, I shout out Tash. When I be with my nigga Tash, I be living the rap life. But then it's back to Logan Ave where I'm living the crack life. And then, um, shit, that's where I got L.A. from there, man. They wasn't gangbanging. That was a circle of MCs from the West Coast that was about the music. And so during that time, man, you know, it was still about the music. But then as time progressed, it started being about other shit. Being from San Diego, you're not going to have the connections. You're not going to have the relationships that's, that's as, 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 as important to the game as the relationships that come when you're from Compton, you know what I'm saying? And if you don't think that matters where you're from, then the, then the evidence of that, of it being about who you know and where you're from, well then how come it ain't no rappers from all the rest of the hundred little cities or hoods in LA? All the rappers is from Compton, West LA, like 60 area, if you look at the neighborhoods that have success, it's the Compton neighborhoods, 60s, Inglewood, um, Long Beach. But look at all the other neighborhoods. So if it ain't about where you from, then how come all them other neighborhoods ain't got no Snoop Dogg, Gang, MAC-10, you know, the cats in these other cities? It's real important. So then if they can't even get in the big building, how the fuck hard do you think it is for somebody from San Diego to get in the big building? If them other neighborhoods that's in L.A. can't even make it through and constantly Compton hit, hit over years, decades and decades of Compton artists, that, that's got to be about where you're from. So then, if, if that, you know, shit, why you think the rest of them neighborhoods ain't got 
no artists because that shit's important as fuck. So in San Diego, we ain't we ain't got it. We ain't got the relationships needed. So nowadays, man, it's a fraternity. If you ain't part of that fraternity, and then San Diego also being a city where they not really going to jump up and go crazy for a San Diego artist because they looking at their San Diego artist. We ain't from Oklahoma. We ain't from wherever, uh, fucking uh, Detroit. I ain't knocking Detroit because this nigga's in Detroit now. But I'm saying during this time, you're a San Diego artist and the same people that's supposed to love you is looking at you next to Snoop Dogg. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Next to Tupac. You're not shit. In the eyes, even though you could be talented as a motherfucker, have all the shit you, you need to be on, you're not going to be looked at as whatever being from this city. We're fucking, we, we're, we're next to fucking Hollywood. We're next to L.A. It's hard, homie, you know? We trying to get them, we trying, the same bag that we trying to eat out of is the same bag that rappers from Compton trying to eat out of. You think it's easier now with the internet? Fuck yeah. Especially easy, easier talent wise, cause you don't you don't gotta have no no talent. Some that means some niggas got talent, but you can get on and not have no talent. In our era, nobody was not getting on. Before the era I came up off of, and the motherfuckers I was watching when when Cuban M was coming out and N.W.A. and Above the Law and all that shit, M.C.A. all that shit. Shit, you could not be talented. You had to be talented. Now you can have swag and, you know, fuck the right bitches on, on live and shit or whatever the fuck or <laughs> get head on live or, you know, have a shootout and or whatever the fuck. It'd be a bunch of other shit outside and are you talented? But fuck it. I ain't mad at it. You know, fuck it. Yeah, it, it seems like in a we live in a attention era or, you know, attention. Popularity. Is, yeah, popularity. Attention. Who's ever popular? Is is more is 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 can actually get you put on. I mean, I think uh, Cardi B, popular. You know, she was she had this huge Instagram following and then started to rap. That's crazy. I, I followed Cardi B before she even got on the show. She pop up viral all the time. Mm. I was watching Cardi B before. She was funny as a motherfucker. Yeah, yeah. you get yeah. the numbers up. You build that platform. No matter how you built it, you get on there and make some music. Shit, everybody music sound the same. Shit, you know. Well, um, man, you got a movie out. For sure. Baby Gangsters. Baby Gangster, man. Written, produced, funded, shot, starred in by all real Crips and Bloods. We brought Crips and Bloods from like 15, 20 different neighborhoods. Sat down, made a plan, and made a movie, man, and showed the whole world this new format for getting money in our communities. Everybody in the movie owns a share in the movie. Shout out to my homeboy Westbred Diamond from our schoolyard. You know what I'm saying? He 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 put he put the play together, and uh, you know, everybody else in the movie that you see fell in. I, I reached out to a couple homies of mine. We put it together. I reached out to a couple young homies of mine. Snatched cash from all over. You know, we we put it together. Got the homies cars and homegirls stepped in to help out. You know what I'm saying? Everybody threw all they threw all their pennies in, and we came up with a real movie. You know, real gunshots, real shootouts. Real cameras, you know, no but no 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 small budget shit. We went big on it and made a real hood flick. We ain't have one in a long time. And it's it's the best and the realest depiction of our 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 lives. Street life of Southern California. It's real. A lot of other shit being glorified and shit, but this shit right here is just like regular everyday life for us. But it showed the real shit. Not just the bad shit. It showed the hurt shit. The heartfelt shit. The gang interventionists. You got a message in the movie, you know what I'm saying? So we proud about that. Yeah, I, I noticed that it had a positive message in it. Can you mm -hmm. talk about that a little bit? Well, basically, we, we, we wanted to show the reality of what's going on. Because if you're in the hood now, you will see. Everybody, everybody, all the OGs hanging out influencing stupid shit and, and telling niggas to grab a gun and go shoot a motherfucker and all that type of shit. It's big homies in the neighborhood, usually for the most part, telling the youngsters to get their money and take care of their family. And so we wanted to show that. We wanted to show a real look. We wanted to show a real look. And the homies way interactive anyway with a lot of, um, you know, cleaning up the streets of L.A., uh, West Bread Diamond is. And so, man, he, he's with a company, I mean, with a group called Unity One. And uh, they, was, they was big in a lot of the gang troops in L.A. and all that shit. So he been on a mission trying to get the streets right and get the homies together on the page to get money. 
but we want we wanted to show the reality of it so we put we put all the shit in it we got real known street gang activists from la in the, in the actual movie playing the parts of the activists real gang members being real gang members shit dope yeah yeah man i it was it was really a dope movie i liked it how uh, how can people watch it they got to go to vimeo vimeo online if you got a smart tv just go download vimeo or on your phone or better yet go to mitchy slick wrong kind on Insta Instagram and look at my bio and just hit the hit the link, you know. Are you guys gonna be getting it on bigger platforms? We were supposed to be in the big in the bit on the big screen, but the, the COVID shit fucked everything up. No way. That's fucked. We had a screening in Hollywood at the uh, Hollywood with the Beverly Hills um whatever theater we was gonna do it up, homie red carpet, all the shit. And then um COVID hit and just fucked up our place. So right now we're trying to figure it out. We're looking for a home for it on a big giant platform, but we ain't trying to give it up for crumbs. So that's what it's about. We're trying to get on one of these big, big, big platforms, but we need the bread, though. Have you turned down any deals? Yeah. Hell yeah, we turned down deals. A gang of them. Okay. But we sitting on it. This shit ain't going to get old. Motherfuckers still watching Minister Society and uh, Boys in the Hood today. You feel me? This shit going to be around. So we ain't tripping. We take our time. We ain't finna fold. Ain't nobody starving. Are you guys planning on doing any more movies? Hell yeah. We're trying to go to every hood and make a hood movie. Um, this just the beginning, bro. We already got like two or three scripts on the table right now we finna run with. We just got a format for doing it to where we can include everybody in different neighborhoods. When we come to your neighborhood, whoever over there body got their bread together, we sit at the table, make some business and let the hood eat off the movies instead of Hollywood eat off our, our, our lives. You feel me? Yeah, but that that's later to come. Yeah, man. So how long did it take you guys to put this together? A couple of weeks, homie. It took a couple of weeks to shoot it. But then far as doing all the behind the scenes shit, man, it took us two and a half years to get it right. But we shot and we shot in twelve days and then edited and sound and color correction, all that shit. It took a while, man. It wasn't no fifty, twenty, or thirty no, nah, it was some real bands involved. You feel me? We got like a couple thousand couple million dollar movie. We didn't spend a couple million dollar on it, but it's most definitely a couple of million dollar movie. You know, made I don't want to compare it to other movies, but for us to spend, to have spent what we spent and the other big movies spent what they spent, are they going to hate us when we get the real bad? Because mm -hmm. we know what to do now. That first one was a test run. We ready to go now, though. It don't look like a test run, but it was. I mean, it was really put together good, man. Good so. looking, homie. Yeah, for sure, man. You know, I'm, congratulations on it too, man. Thank you, bro. Thank you. You know, you you know the acting. Thank you. It wasn't like no, you know, generic actors Straight or up. Straight up. you know everything looked real. looked real and mm -hmm. you know it was uh it was dope, man. Hopefully, hopefully you guys you know, I, you know I want to see you guys put some more movies out. For sure, for sure. Yeah. Well, um, I also noticed you you did a song with Nipsey. For sure. How did all that come together? Me and Nip have been planning on working for a while. Nip, Nip, man, when I first met Nip, man, was at this, at this, uh, I think it was a sneaker convention. Nick, Nip walked up, walked up to me, had a hundred of his homies with me, and just came up to me, man, and greeted me unlike any other artist that I ever ran into, and showed the, the amount of respect and and homage and, and love for my craft that he showed me was unmatched, and it really let let that was the first. As I look back on it now. It, it's, you know, Nip was a little different than the rest of these motherfuckers and the shit that niggas be talking, they just be talking it. But Nip was really about that, though. If Nip said he support niggas and want to see niggas shine, he meant that. And he meant it more than the average person mean when they say it. You know what I mean? Nip was a real dude. Didn't have no hate in him, man. That nigga was a real dude. And um, he told me that he wanted to work with me in the beginning, and it took us a while to get to it. But um, me and Nip end up coming back around each other by uh, sharing some producers. I was working with some producers at the time. Uh, Mike and Keys, it was the Futuristics at the time. They was being managed, they still managed, or be, was being managed by my big homie, uh, Big Reese from San Diego. Everybody know Big Reese. And um, shit, man, I was grinding it out with them. I even had built a studio at my house in Malibu just for the futuristics to work. We was trying to put this team together, you know, with a few artists I had. I had like four or five artists from San Diego and we was going to work with the futuristics. And we had a couple studios over the couple years trying to get it right. But in the process of that and then working on my album, they met Nipsey. 
And so from us having a studio and then Nip fucking with the Futuristics, then we got a studio together. And, and a lot of the shit I had and I was working on and my whole crew was working on got put on halt based upon this meeting of the Futuristics and Nip. Because from that point on, it basically was all Nip after that. So we had big plans to do a lot of shit at the time. But when the Futuristics met Nip, they turned into the, the soul, I mean, the, um, the foundation of Nip's sound and whole production crew. You know what I'm saying? Like, they the ones that put together all them last projects and shit. You know what I mean? And so just over the time of us being around, you know what I'm saying? And I knew it was important for the Futuristics to fuck with them. So I kind of fell back and just let that relationship between them build. And that's all where them great songs with Nip came from. But it was basically, a lot of that shit was basically my sound. You feel me? Straight up. Because then was my producers. And so then when they met Nip, they was doing that. You know? And it, it was, it was, it was, the shit that he was making with him was, was incredible. You know what I'm saying? I sat around and fucked with him and came in the studio one day when Nip was just, um, Nip used to spend a lot of time at the computer and shit, really just studying mostly. You know what I'm saying? I never really be there and Nip just be a straight studio head working all the time. That motherfucker be on the computer learning some shit or reading about something or history or political shit or new music shit or whatever the fuck it was. But seldom just in there like the average artist just working in the studio all the time. And so I think it was a period where Nip wasn't working. And I just came in the lab one day from Dago Studio was over there in North Hollywood. I was like, what's up, Nip? Let's let's knock something out. He said, fuck it, let's go. We went in the box and came out in the hour, and everybody that was in the studio had just came back and was looking what they jaws dropped like. What you do, Slick? How you get him to get in there? That nigga ain't recorded in like three, four months. So I ain't do shit. I just told him, let's get down. And he got down. Me and Nip got down like that. I tell a lot of Nip stories. But it's not because I was with Nip every day all the time. My my big bro Reese was with Nip every day all the time. But the times that we was together, the times was so um educational and influ influential on you know both our shit. Cause I get shit from him, he get shit from me. We used to talk a lot about street shit, homie, and political street shit. Cause it should be crazy doing this rap shit when you from one of these neighborhoods out here, homie. It's a lot of bullshit that come along with it. And you always hear about Nip shit. You always hear about my shit. But me and him would spar about that type of shit. You know what I mean? He'd wonder how I did certain shit. And I'd be like, damn, well, nigga, how you get away with that? Did certain shit. And, and basically situations like the situation where Nip, you know, was killed. That's the type of shit we'd be talking about. Being in the hood, having a business in the hood, you know, being on this and interviewing here and being around these niggas and shit like that. But we talked about important shit the time we was around each other. So I don't say it like I was with Nip every day, but then it wasn't like I never was with Nip. But I talk about him so much because the time we was together, we was talking about real shit that I really couldn't talk to with nobody else. You know what I mean? You guys related on another level that yeah. other people couldn't really... If yeah. you weren't a rapper and a real homie, so, yeah, rapper, real homies. It's a lot of rappers from their hoods. It's a lot of rappers that you know grew up from their hood or from the gang. But but when you like in the center of your neighborhood, you know, what I'm saying a center of the homies, it's center of the political shit going on in the neighborhood. It's a little different. It's a lot different, actually. You know what I mean? Motherfuckers expect a lot more out of you. Well, man, I think that's that's about it, man. I. uh Man, I appreciate you, man. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We did a, a decent one. Yeah, man. This was dope, man. A lot of things. I think a lot of stuff that the fans don't didn't know. You know, I appreciate you, uh, you know, taking the time, man. Good, good, good. Good seeing you, homie. Yeah, for sure. I got a lot of more shit going on. We might have more shit to talk about soon. That's what's shit. up. I'm definitely looking forward to it. Yeah, we got the um, this movie I'm in with Chris Brown. And um, Birdman and Nick Cannon finna come out too and shit. And right now I'm working on the soundtrack. I got some songs coming out on that soundtrack. It's gonna be coming out on Cash Money and shit. Shout out to the homeboy Nick and this new movie we got coming out, uh, She Ball. The song I got on there right now is produced by the homie Trey Bug. We in here working on it in the next room as we speak, homie. So you know, stay, stay around and get a bar. 
Yeah, definitely, bro. I, I, yes, yeah. Sir. Yes, sir. Appreciate you, man. You already know. All right.